Hi, my name is Michelle schubert Clausen, and you're listening to Catholic vs. Protestant. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, if you would please, who you are, what you believe, and how you came to believe what you believe. Okay. So I currently work for Pioneer Bible Translators, and it's a Bible translation and church planting organization. And I work for them because of how the Bible drastically transformed my life, or I should say how God used the Bible to drastically transform my life about six or seven years ago now. I had grown up in the church, specifically uh, Protestant, maybe Baptist when I was little, but non-denominational when I was older. But I did not know God. I had never had like an experience with God that I could point to or, or, you know, something that had been really transformative. And my life showed it. And then uh, when I was 24, I had a spiritual encounter or a series of spiritual encounters. And I guess those have continued to this day. So because of, of the direction that that then like spurred my life, I got involved in work like I'm doing. How were you raised? What sort of environment were you raised in? Was there religion in the home? Just sort of talk, if you would, about some of the earliest memories about God and religion, please. So I was born into a family that's very religious. My grandparents were missionaries on one side. My dad is a pastor, preacher. And so I grew up in church always. All of the church functions, all of the events, you know, Awana, if you're familiar with that. No. Uh, in, you know, an event that you bring your kids to every week and they learn Bible verses and do different tasks and stuff. It's kind of like, I would almost say it's kind of like Boy Scouts or something, except uh, specifically church focused. And so I was around it. I was very familiar. In fact, I have memories of, you know, sitting around the dinner table and my dad quizzing me on what Martin Luther said about such and such or certain theological points about this background or this belief. And so, yeah, so I was very well, very well acquainted with Christian faith growing up. How old were you when you decided that, yes, you you believe in God, you love God, you want to worship God, and you want to give your life to God? Do you remember a specific moment? You said at 24 it happened, but did it happen earlier, perhaps in a more naive fashion? Uh, because when you're 24, you're already an adult. Uh, but I'm talking about a, sort of an earlier moment where without the sophistication of theology, you decided that you believed in God and that you loved God. Can you remember any moment like that? So I think growing up, I mostly believed because of what I was told by my parents. You know, it's kind of, I think most children at least start that way. You just kind of believe that there is a God and that he's like whatever your parents are, are telling you he's like. I would pray in times of sadness, in times of pain, probably like most people. I feel like even atheists probably do that. And or maybe if I really wanted something, you know, times of, of eagerness or desire for one thing or another. And I would definitely have said that I was a Christian and thought that I was or, or you know, I, I did have a, a naive or, or childlike faith when I was a child. So yeah, I would I would say that's fair. Before we get to the 24-year-old experience, I want you to talk a little bit, without embarrassing yourself, about the dark years, your rebellion. Did you go as far as to deny God explicitly? Or can you just talk about the dark side to the extent that you're comfortable, please? Yeah. So, so my parents are very, very strict. And as soon as I was outside of their care, or outside of their shelter, you know, going off to college, that's when I really started to realize, what do I actually believe? And between the age of 18 and 23, I, I realized, by the time I was 23, this is what I realized, but this is what had been happening since I was 18. Uh, I, I thought that Christians were people that did this list of things and didn't do that list of things. And little by little, my list would change to include the things that I was doing or not doing. <laughs> and so um, little by little, I guess, I started to realize that I didn't know, I didn't have any proof 
for what I believed, other than, you know, there's apologetics and you can learn facts about this or that or, you know, little things that you think make the Bible sound true or more realistic or I don't know, different things like this. But ultimately, if you don't experience God for yourself, for me, it felt like I had no proof. That was just this ideal that everyone was working toward. Everyone was hoping for this cool experience or this or a coincidence so big that they had to say it was God. And eventually, all of these things kind of came to a head when I was 23. Uh, I started to realize that I was my own God. I was the judge. I was the one that decided whether or not an action was sinful or righteous. And and I, I finally admitted that I don't know God. You know, I finally admitted if there is a God, I've never heard from him, nor have I ever felt him or met him. And and I, I guess I never went so far as to say there was no God. Uh, I think I always believed in a creating force, and I believed that that creating force had to be knowable. And that was just a simple philosophical journey for me was if something created anything that being is powerful and would have known i think would have known with that much power would have known what it was creating and it created me who has a desire to know the creator and so if he's not knowable if he she or it is not knowable then it's worthless and it can't be worthless if it created all this it was this kind of circular reasoning but that kept assuring me that there was a creator who is knowable. And so that's kind of then what spurred on my actual pursuit of that being. Hmm. Can you talk about the moment or moments that brought you to a a solid faith in God? Where were you? What were you doing? And uh, just describe it for us if you can. Yeah. So when I was 23, once I started to have that feeling or that acknowledgement that I didn't know God and that I didn't know anything uh, at all, it was humbling and it was scary. And I would cry on my knees in prayer or meditation, whatever you, I don't know, just cry out to whatever God was there, whatever God would hear me, whatever God would respond. And I, that probably took place for months, I would say, uh, daily or or close to it. And I just, I guess I, I hate not knowing things. And so that drove me to, yeah, a fervent prayer, a fervent cry, begging for if anyone was out there to make themselves known to me. And that, of course, that time was was also then riddled with exploring all the different ideas, all the different possibilities, you know, different religions or different ideas, different philosophies. And when I was 24, there was a time that I was uh, surprisingly uh, reading through uh, the Bible, something in the Old Testament. I want to say that it was something to do with Elijah, one of the, you know, grand miracles that is described um, involving Elijah. And I remember pushing the Bible away from me and thinking, and I might have even said this out loud, really? I'm supposed to believe that this is factually accurate history? And maybe what's more unbelievable, I'm supposed to believe that the Christians that I know believe that this is the God they're praying to? This is the God they're praying to when they, you know, have the glazed over look on Sunday mornings with their hands in their pockets. How great thou art. You know, this like very bored look. And that's hard to believe that they think this is the God they're they're singing to. And this is the God they're praying to when they pray, you know, wimpy prayers. Lord, maybe you please, if it be your will, could you possibly give us traveling mercies? And that was hard for me to to believe. And I was sitting there, I guess, having a conversation with the God that I didn't know yet and saying, if I believed this, my worship would be dramatic. If this is who I thought I was worshiping, thought I was connecting with, thought I was praising, if I thought this was the God I was praying to, my prayers would look dramatic. 
I would ask for crazy things. If I thought this was the goddess that I worshipped or the god that I knew, like, my life would look different. My life would look exceptional. And somehow, and this is the part that I can't, that I have no explanation for, because I was at a pretty uh, hard location of, of disbelief. And somehow, at in that same moment, then, I was given faith. And I remember saying to God, okay, I believe this book speaks truth about you, and I'm going to live like it. I'm going to be in it 100%. I'm going to do all of the things that I think this book is encouraging me to do, and I'm going to seek the God that's described in this book 100%. And if in 10 years or in 10 minutes I find out it's wrong, I will feel good about walking away saying that I was in it 100%. And from that day on, I was blown away. So what did your parents make of your perilous journey away from and then back to God? Were they aware of any part of the drama or no? I don't know if they knew the extent of it while it was happening. They definitely didn't know... Uh, maybe the angst. I, I didn't feel comfortable sharing with too many people the emotional or spiritual like angst that I had been going through during that time. And so I don't, in fact, I don't remember sharing with, with just about anybody. Yeah. That to me tells me that we do have an intimacy with God, a personal relationship with God, but it's hard to explain to someone that hasn't been in that desperate situation yet it's hard to explain the intimacy but i think it's very very clear for all that just listen to your story that you had an intimacy with god even while you were doubting him and you have that personal relationship with god do you want to comment on that am i right or am i way off base i i think you're right i think for a lot of us when we are in those moments of of deep emotional or spiritual angst and we're crying out to God, even if we don't necessarily believe in him, I think that's easier to do than to a person because worst case scenario, God doesn't exist and you're crying to yourself. (laughs) And so there's not much downside. And then best case scenario, he's a loving God and he's going to answer you and hear your, you know, see your tears or hear your, your cries. But I, I do absolutely believe that, that intimacy with the creator is achievable or attainable or yeah it's not impossible it's not foreign and strange it's so natural it's so familiar that we just don't recognize it most of us until we go through something like what you went through and then you have that grace to recognize it but i think that everyone is always experiencing that and they just don't have the eyes to see right yeah yeah and of course they're not taking advantage of it that's the downside of not uh, being aware of that relationship but i i'm a firm believer in that sort of one-on-one relationship that god has with each of his children and that he's cooperating 100 percent, 100 percent of the time that's a hard one for me because i went through i went through a really uh tough and dark time in my young adult years and i feel like i did reach out over and over and over for help it, without response. And so I think that was actually, I should have mentioned that earlier. I kind of had glossed over that in my memory. That was some some part of my story that, in a sense, kind of pushed me away from the church and away from God and away from the Bible, away from Christianity, was because I did feel like I had reached out over and over and over And I'd always felt, or I'd always been told, you know, well, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you or something like that, or the prodigal son story or any things like this. And, um, and yet I felt like I had done that over and over, kept reaching out my hand and and grasping at nothing. And so I don't know what the difference was. What was the difference between that time of, of crying out and, and the time when I was 24? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you know about me, but I was atheist for 25 years, uh, my whole entire adult life. And uh, I too had gone through some dark stuff. And I, I you know, I, I can admit that in the darkest moments, I would have questions about, is it possible that this God exists? And, uh, you know, something akin to a prayer, not really a prayer, but something akin to a prayer, maybe 
would uh, bounce around in my troubled and confused head at those dark, dark times. And, uh, you know, so if I wanted to, I could say the same thing. Like, why did God wait so long, so patiently, for just the right moment to touch me? And uh, such a gentle touch. Uh, I want to talk also about the gentleness of God, the patience of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God. And uh, I was a dark, dark atheist and very anti-Christian. And um, when I converted, there was never any mention of that. There were no reprisals. There was no guilt trip. There was nothing. There was just love and gentleness. So I, I want you to talk about the gentleness of God. When he, when he welcomes someone back, how gentle and how soft he is. Can you just talk about that from your personal experience, please? Yeah. Oh, I wish you could see my face. It's all smiles right now on this subject. Even the word God, you know, we can't, we can't absorb all that that means. And we'll, you know, our minds can't, our hearts can't, our, we just can't. I feel so grateful that when I did come into a relationship with the creator that I feel like he erased all of the things I thought I knew about him, like I, and about religion. I, I didn't care anymore about uh, the right theology and who taught this and, and what book says that. And I didn't care about who's sinning in what way, like it became just personal and it became hopeful. Everything, all experience became hopeful. And um, it wasn't me striving anymore. It was me waking up excited to ask God his opinion on the day and the tasks at hand. And it was so different than any other day of my life leading up to that point. So... I, I don't have any better words. Well, I'm picturing sunshine after a dark and stormy night. That's what I'm picturing as you're speaking. Just that gentle warmth, the light, the clarity, the vision, the hope. And um, you're in the here and now and you see you can see the future ahead of you. And uh, you're not worried about that dark night that you spent sopping wet in uh, the rain and the tears, right? Yeah, it's interesting because I, I also felt like I... I felt like, and I don't know if this is true, I felt like I struggled, and maybe still do, struggle with sin more than everyone else. And I don't know why I feel that way, because logically, that doesn't seem likely, but I'm living it, and so I'm like, well, no, that's what's going on. Um, and so I feel like it was also interesting to, for the first time in my life, understand grace. Even though I knew the definition of grace from the time I was five, you know, and I could quote verses throughout the Bible about grace, but it was when I was 24 that I felt grace and realized that, you know, that moment of, of contrition once you, you know, after sinning is also an extremely happy moment. It's a grateful moment. It's a celeb like you're even celebrating because once again, you ha you can thank Jesus, praise Jesus for what he's done. Uh, and then, and then that also gives you so much grace then for others, because, you know, the more the more grace you experience, I feel like the more grace you can extend to to those around you. Yeah. And this brings me to my next question, which is sort of um, a misunderstood aspect of certainly Christianity, if not other monotheistic religions, uh, Judaism and Islam. But we'll stick with Christianity for the moment. This misunderstood notion is the fear of God. And uh, those who don't know God really mischaracterize the fear of God. But it is a filial fear of offending. And uh, when you and I decide that we don't want to sin, we don't want to offend our loving Father, that holy fear is not full of dread. It's not full of anxiety. On the contrary, it's full of light and warmth and love and hope and, and joy and energy. And it's anything but uh, a cowardly, slavish fear, right? For me, I, and I totally agree, it's not this, it's not a, a a fear and anxiety. It's it's a reverence or a an awe. The first couple thousand times I prayed after first encountering God, I was always on my knees. I would I would kneel down to pray out of that reverence, out of this 
realizing this is a holy presence I'm I'm coming into or or that I'm beckoning as I as I say these words and I want to show how reverent how awe filled I am and still to this day I I do but it's not every single time but at the same time there's like a trust in him you know it, what what is it what is the verse um love casts out fear or something like that and that's true you know i think when we think of the end of our lives i think everyone is going to have an initial fear and those who love god will you know that love will take over not, not the fear i kind of feel like there's really two good reasons to obey and the first one, I don't know if you'd call it the fear of God. I, I would almost just say, like, even in a, in a normal relationship with a human that you love and you want to please, you want to do the things that they want you to do. You know, you want to do the things that make them happy. And so that's the first reason, I think, for obedience. And then secondly, out of wisdom, because, you know, if this being really does know the best way to live and then told you, well, you're kind of an idiot to go against that and not do that. So I don't know how the fear of God kind of works into that. It does somehow, but I'm tiptoeing around it right now, and I, I haven't put my finger on it quite yet, how, the, where the connection is. Hmm. When I came to God, it was only to God the Father. And so I assumed that I must be a Muslim of some sort, because uh, even though I didn't believe in Muhammad and uh, the Quran and all of that, I, did not, I definitely did not want to be Christian. So I, I only had God the Father. But through divine providence or sheer luck, although I don't believe in luck, so I guess it must be providence, I, uh, I ran into a, a monk and he educated me in the faith because I asked him if I could talk to him about God because all of my friends here in Montreal are atheists or agnostics. So uh, he welcomed me into his monastery and he educated me and I said, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe in the Trinity. I don't believe any of this Christian stuff, but I do worship your God. I know that for sure. And it's the God of classical theism because I have a, a background in philosophy. So I had encountered a lot of classical theism. So um, long story short, I started with God the Father and I was very uh, trepidatious, uh, having been a staunch enemy of Christ and his church for my whole adult life. But through the grace of God and through a sound education, I came to accept all of the teachings, the fundamental teachings of Christianity. And I'm sure you would agree with most of them, although uh, there's some doctrinal differences between the Catholics and the Protestants. But the essentials we would agree on, things as fundamental as God being a triune God with Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So I want you to uh, talk a little bit about your relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I still am very jealous of God the Father. I want to make sure that he is uh, never offended. But I am obviously, now it's been 10 years I've been Christian, I am obviously growing close to Jesus Christ. And I feel a little bit like I'm neglecting the Holy Spirit. So I want, I've sort of characterized my relationship with the three persons of the Trinity, and I'd like you to return the favor and sort of talk about how maybe you place a little bit too much emphasis here, or not enough emphasis there, or if you have a very balanced relationship with the Trinity, or if you don't even worry about that sort of thing at all. Just talk a little bit about the Trinity, if you would. Yeah. Definitely, when I first came to faith, I was interacting with God the Father. But I also very quickly, because of my upbringing or because it was in the Bible that I, that I kind of like met God the Father, you know, Jesus was a very, very easy addition. And I don't have too much of a distinction between the two. I mean, in one sense, like you said, you know, God the Father is, is, the, is the one we're reverent toward. And I do kind of, in a sense, feel that Jesus is more of my, he's more my friend or my, my brother. And so actually... I don't have any idea if this is good or bad. I sometimes will ask Jesus to like pray for <laughs> Jesus. Can you pray that this happens? Cause I know, <laughs> cause I know God listens to your prayers. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and you know, I think I do remember, you know, in the Bible talking about Jesus interceding for us. So yeah, so I guess I feel uh, a, a closerness if that's, I'm going to say that's a word 
a closerness <laughs> to Jesus and, a, and more of a reverence toward God the Father. But I, I do definitely give praise to both, like as I'm singing or, or praying or, or all these things. The Holy Spirit, though, I grew up not seeing evidence of the Holy Spirit. And I think creation is evidence enough of God the Father. And there might be historical facts that can be said to be evidence of Jesus. And when I when I feel like I met God the Father, I feel like I instantly had the Holy Spirit with me as well. And that was very, very clear because of conviction of sin, because of leadings, things that I felt led to do that I would never, ever, ever do and would never want to do. And then I would do them and it would be, it would turn out amazing. Something would happen that, you know, I, it was confirming that was what I was supposed to do. That was, that was what the Holy Spirit was leading me to do. And then even, even things blatant, you know, because some people could say, oh, you just felt like you should do those nice things or those good things or the hard things. And they worked out and that could have been a coincidence. But even things like I was struggling with sin and I was um, feeling like, and this was probably like a year into following Christ, maybe a little bit more. And I would sin and I would literally kneel down, pray, ask for forgiveness, and then stand up and immediately sin again. And it was this cycle I just felt like I was constantly sinning. There was constantly temptation around me and I had zero power over it. And so I called my prayer partner and I had her come over, Teresa, and I told her what was going on. I think she probably already knew. We'd been talking about it for a bit and we were praying together. And as I'm praying to God, I said, God, I don't know what to do about this. I'm not supposed to be a slave to sin anymore, but here I am. I keep sinning and I don't even, I don't know what to do about it. Like, I've asked you to help me not, but I keep sinning. So that's not it. It's not just asking you, um, should I fast? Like, I don't know. I had only fasted a, a handful of times prior to this, and I had no idea why I was fasting. I just saw it in the Bible, so I decided to do it. Um, and so I asked those words. I said, should I fast over this? I don't even know if that would help. And then I just kind of shut up and sat there. And Teresa started praying, and right then almost kind of like across my vision, I saw Jonah 3, 6. Now, I don't know what Jonah 3, 6 says. I mean, I do now, but at the time, I didn't know what Jonah 3, 6 said. So I stopped Teresa and I said, hold on, we need to read Jonah 3, 6. And I opened up the Bible and the Holy Spirit was a little bit off because actually the verse starts in 3, 5. And it says something like, when the king of Nineveh heard of their sin, he called for a fast for repentance throughout the whole kingdom. And I just like sat there and like we both are like jaws dropped off our faces and we're just like, wow, that was such a clear answer to my prayer. I guess I need to fast. And so I fat and I had never fasted from food and water, but that's what the verse said. And so I was like, all right, God, I'm going to do a fast for repentance. I'm going to fast from food and water. I fasted from food and water for a day for I think it was like, you know, 24 hour fast. And at the end of that 24 hour fast, it was like a, a yoke had been broken off of my back. There was no more temptation around and anything that was around, I was strong against it. And it was this this amazing testimony to me that God's spirit is in me, you know, that he, that he wants my sanctification so badly. He'll answer that prayer like, yeah, Michelle, you should fast for repentance over this. That is a thing. So just stories like that, that's one of quite a few just interactions with the Holy Spirit that often the Holy Spirit will be working in conjunction with, I find, with, with Scripture, which is another reason I, I love the Bible so much. Yeah, he's the primary author of Scripture. And uh, I, while you were speaking, it was reminding me of my own awareness of the Holy Spirit through inspiration and uh, those moments of peace, the moments of consolation. And above all, I think it's inspiration, just that little soft, gentle voice not not even a voice but just that inspiration to pick up and read or to uh, say a prayer or whatever it might be it's always very natural it's always very gentle it's nothing shocking it's nothing bewildering it's always good and if you respond to those graces then you uh, of course are usually 
given some sort of light or some sort of consolation, right? So it's nothing earth shattering, but if we could get in the habit of responding to that yeah. gentle voice, uh, what a change I would see yeah. in this world, right? You know, that's something I wonder about. Like when you read in the Old Testament, these prophets, I'm thinking specifically of Moses, but there was a time I think that Moses went up onto, was it Mount Sinai? I, he went up on one of the mountains for 40 days and 40 nights without food and without water. And then he did it again, like right after that. And I just remember, like, as I'm reading through this and thinking over it, like, that wasn't the first leading that he had. You know, the first leading he had, like you mentioned, like these prophets that all are led to do bizarre, what we think of as, you know, bizarre things. That wasn't their first rodeo. You know, their first leading was get up and pray. You know, I'm I'm assuming, I'm assuming God didn't start off with a marathon, you know, with these guys. And so I guess that's something I think all of us do need to work on is responding affirmatively when we do have those leadings, the little leadings or whatever it is, you know, confront this person or confess to that person or, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, what about the devil and the demons? Can you talk about your experience with the dark side in terms of the spiritual battle, in terms of temptation, in terms of sin, in terms of confusion, in terms of nightmares, and uh, in terms of selfishness and pride? Uh, just talk about how you think the dark forces trick us and ensnare us, please. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know evil is real. And I know that temptation is real. And, you know, there's so much coincidence if you just analyze kind of when your temptation is coming or from where. Uh, it seems like there's definitely themes. As far as interacting or anything with demons or the devil, I have definitely had some experiences that, you know, was, was me encountering demons uh, physically. Uh, in a in a country that I was working in, and that was an extremely frightening encounter, and it was it was also a bizarre one because any time I've ever felt any like uh, sinister presence, I suppose you could call it, you know, I always call out the name of Jesus or or uh, bring God's presence through prayer, but in this particular case that was not working it didn't work it didn't you know it wasn't at least successful for about an hour of prayer over this and it was a it was a location that you know i'm sure a lot of i don't know witchcraft or sorcery whatever different different names you want to call these types of kind of dark practices occur um, and so it wasn't all that bizarre to have this sort of encounter with demonic beings but I think it's different also in different locations. Like, I feel like uh, Satan's no dummy. You know, he's been around longer than we have. And so I think in the States, he does a good job of keeping people unaware of the spiritual realm. And yet in other locations, keeping people in fear of the spiritual realm. So I think it does kind of depend where you are on, on what you experience. But one thing I know for sure, every everybody is experiencing, you know, uh, temptation and evil desires. So I can't deny the the presence of a dark force in in this world. No, I know you don't have the answer, but I'm just curious what you would say if I asked you why why were you given sufficient grace to convert and others around you that you want to convert have not yet received that grace, or have they received it and said no, or is God waiting? for the right time, uh, just uh, play around a little bit with those ideas. Why were you able to say yes so young? I was 39 when I finally said yes, so that's quite a bit later in life than you. But there are other people that have the faith all their life long. And so um, there's a temptation to be jealous of those people. But on the other hand, there's more celebration over that uh, lost sheep that comes back. So maybe I'm the lucky one. Uh, just talk a little bit about the mystery of conversion and uh, those that you would like very much to convert who are not yet converted. They're stubbornly resisting. And uh, what's happening? What's the timeline on their conversion, do you think? Yeah, man, this is something I, I think about often and wonder about often because... 
you know, I don't believe that it was anything intrinsically in me that God was like, oh, I'm going to cause her to love me and, and follow me and understand me, or at least to some little extent, and not this person right next to her. You know, I don't, I have no idea. But what I do know is that I came begging in humility. Like I, I would literally, I was literally saying, God, I don't care what's true. Just show me, you know, even if it's the worst thing I can imagine is, is truth. Show me what's true because I'll follow it. I'll do what I need to do. I'll, you know, just show me truth. And so I think there was a level of humility in my prayers that I had never had before because I always thought that I knew or thought I, you know, I had these preconceived ideas of what was true. And so on one hand, I think humility has a lot to do with it. And we know God gives grace to the humble and he shows the humble his ways. And so I think that's something, and not to say that I'm humble in all aspects, but definitely in that prayer, that was a humble prayer, just begging for truth and direction. So I do think then too, I think of um, Jeremiah, when when God is t- talking and he says, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind because I don't think too many people, at least in my sphere, could say honestly that they have sought God with all their heart. You, you know, and I, I believe that's a true statement. You will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's something that's very seldom done in our culture. And maybe it's because we're comfortable. Maybe it's because we kind of have most of the things we need, most of the things we want. And so we don't need to, we don't have a desperation to, to search for truth or to search for help. Um, so I do wonder about that. And, and maybe there's just some of us that get so desperate for whatever reason that we do seek with all of our heart and not just like a knock on the door but knocking until it's answered but then I I think of also I think of people that I've prayed with or that I've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit with who then deny any knowledge of God and I do wonder about that thinking wait what you were with me when this happened you were with me how do you not believe anymore and and I can understand uh, beliefs changing throughout the years denominationally or uh, theologically I totally get that because and I think we should change if we never change our minds we're probably never growing but to kind of deny the whole the whole picture after seeming to have experienced it on a very real level uh, that definitely confuses me and I have I have no idea as you were speaking, you reminded me of the parable of the seeds that fell on the different types of terrain. Can you describe uh, from memory the different types of terrain that the seeds fell on and what that yeah. represented? So it seems that Jesus was talking and he said uh, a sower came along and was sowing seeds. Some fell on, was it on the path? And were those the ones I think that were picked up by the birds? And then some fell on the rocky area and some fell um some were choked by weeds yeah they were choked by weeds and then some fell on good soil and then the disciples ask him you know what does this mean and he says there's some seeds that have fallen on the path and i don't know if how he says it but something like the evil one then comes and steals away their their faith immediately something like that. And then the seed that fell in the rocky, you know, it begins to take root, but then when the weeds come up and and choke it out, that's the the worries of the world, the cares of the world, these other, you know, the carrot that's being dangled in front of them from their job or their relationships or whatever it is. And, uh, And so their faith gets stolen as well, but then there's the good soil and that then yields something, what, 10, 20, 100 fold. It's something I think we need to remember, uh, all people of faith, to nurture that little gift of faith that we have and to look around and to see the stories of those who grew cold and who were choked out of their faith and who fell away from the faith and uh, how tragic it looks from within the faith. And to humble yourself and to say that there, but for the grace of God, go I. There's nothing preventing me 
from suffering a worse fate. And I think I've just realized now what the fear of God is. I think that's it. Dear God, don't let that happen to me. Don't let me ever grow cold in my love and my faith. Yeah. This interview is coming to an end, but I can't resist to ask you about Survivor. Uh, (laughs) Can you just talk a little bit about how that affected your faith or more importantly, how your faith affected your journey and maybe even uh, your friends and uh, companions on the island? Yeah. So I was on Survivor, what now, three years ago or so? Survivor 33, Millennials vs. Gen X. And uh, I had just begun my job at Pioneer Bible Translators. I think I'd been working there six months or so. And I'd been a believer two years at that point, three years maybe. I don't remember. And um, that was an interesting that was an interesting journey for sure. It was rough. Um, you know, you you can't when you're watching it on TV. If you do a really good job of imagining, you can probably imagine the pain they're in. But it's rough you know you you're starving all day you're freezing all night you're trying to form friendships but you also know that they're gonna they're gonna uh vote you off and get rid of you as soon as possible and you're gonna do the same to them so it's this emotional game as well as physical and you're with people that just from all different walks of life you know i have I have donors. Donor support is, is you know, how my, my paycheck comes through is people that know the work that I'm doing and, and support me to do it um, through donating to, to the organization. And once the, you know, on the show, you have cameras on you all the time, lots of cameras. And so I just remember when I got home from the show, I remember emailing my supporters before it aired on TV saying, Hey guys, so you probably know, you know, I'm on this upcoming season of Survivor. I just want to ask for grace ahead of time because I probably sinned and they have it from three angles. So, <laughs> like, so please be gracious. Like, like I had cameras on me 23 days, like 24 hours all day. So anyways, um, <laughs> that was kind of a, a weird fear is like putting yourself in this location where if you sin or if you do anything wrong, or even that could look wrong, uh, it could be exploited, you know, very clearly. And that could be detrimental to my, now my job, which in other people's lives that, you know, they don't have to worry about that. Like if their boss thinks they're an idiot on one episode, like no worries, but it was a little more costly for me. And um, it was interesting, you know, being on a reality show, being a a believer on a reality show, I was... I guess I wasn't surprised. I was, um, it was interesting to see how many people hated me just for my beliefs. People on the island or viewers? Um, there were, there was definitely some pushback on the island, but viewers, particularly social media, I would receive a lot of angry tweets or messages from people that just hate Christianity or whatever. And that was, like I said, that wasn't surprising, but it was definitely, you can't, it's still hurtful. Nobody likes to be hated. And the worst part, though, was actually fellow Christians, or or at least people that are, that are you know, churchgoers. I received also hate mail from them. And um, that was a harder thing, because I already felt kind of like I was down, and then like I was being kicked by my own team while I was down. And overall, I'll say, you know, it was an interesting experience. It was, it was a tough experience, but I'm glad I did it. So I'm not like sitting here lamenting, oh, it was so awful to be on Survivor. No, it was great to be on Survivor. It was really neat, awesome experience. Um, but there was definitely like spiritual, not uh, turmoil is a strong word, but a, a period of time where I felt just scrutinized by everyone, no matter which side they're on. And it was interesting because that was about a year of my life where God was silent. Uh, I felt like he was just not responding and just never did respond during that whole year. And that was kind of when I needed him to respond the most or what I felt like. And so altogether, that was pretty rough, pretty rough time, but growing. Like I, I grew a lot in my understanding of the church, in my understanding of myself, of my understanding of people's perceptions all of those things, you know, helped me grow because I was forced to be a lot more introspective and a lot more 
I don't know. Yeah, just thoughtful uh, to the scenario that I'm in and, and the, the perspective everybody else had. Do you think you were selected um, during the profiling phase, like the interview phase? They, they like to get different sorts of characters, but do you think you were the Christian girl? Like, what was the interview process like? Did it come up at all? It actually, it came up all the time in the interview process and not on purpose. Like, they would ask me an honest question like... Um, do you like coconuts? And you'd say, praise Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, like, uh, I don't know, they would ask about my dating life or something. And so if it came out that I'm, you know, celibate at the time, I, I wasn't married. And so then they're like, wait, why? You know, and so then my honest answer had to be kind of the full gospel. Like, well, my life was transformed. Let me tell you about this time I was reading about Elijah, and then God said this, and I did that. And so now I'm celibate. <laughs> and so, um, Whatever the question was, my my honest answer, if I was to explain anything about my life, what was an answer that came from the Bible or or you know my faith. So that was definitely in the interview process, but I don't think that's why they selected me. I, I think they selected me because, if I had to guess, it had to, I I smile a lot and I'm articulate. You know, I think they wanted those things, and I think um, I think it was more to do with my storytelling than my story. So just, I have to get this question out there because my friend thinks that all reality TV is scripted. It's all fake. It's all actors and models. Oh, goodness. So uh, you can put that myth to rest. It's real, right? Like that you're a real person. Oh my goodness. Yes. Okay. So here's the thing is Survivor is kind of like geared towards family. Like it's kind of a family show. It is about deceit, but it's, it's pretty clean. They don't show a fourth of the drama that's going down on the island. Like, they're keeping it clean. <laughs> they could make it really dramatic, and they just, they don't. You know, they, they show the strategy, and they show the funny things, and they I think they do a really good job of showing what needs to be shown. But everyone's starving, everyone's angry. If you think about it this way, they have a perfect scenario. They put 20 strangers on an island, they don't feed them, they are not sleeping, so everyone's hungry and tired and trying to win a million dollars. Like you're not going to need to manufacture any drama. And I have heard from production assistants that other reality shows are not so real. That was why these production assistants were saying that they really loved to work on Survivor because you're just watching people live and watching people interact. So It's authentic. Are you allowed to talk to the cameraman and the guy holding the microphone? No, and all that? no, you're not. There were times that you do because, like, the cameraman, like, at this one time kept stepping on my foot every time he tried to get a different <laughs> angle. And so I finally just, like, looked at him and was like, dude, that's my foot. And <laughs> um, he goes, oh, sorry, I thought it was a stump. I was like, <laughs> no, every time you've been, like, he's been, like, propping his foot up on my foot to try to get a different angle and everything. I was like, dude, chill. <laughs> Stop. Um so yeah, you do end up talking to them in uh, like tiny bits, but it's for the most part, you're supposed to act like they're not there and just well, live your life. I can give you a little hint if you ever go back on the show. When you're looking for a hidden immunity idol, just look at where the cameraman's pointing the I camera. Know. They, they always look, <laughs> they always know where it is. That's a story for another time, but I learned the hard way where where the idol was, was hidden. <laughs> um. Do you remember some of the earlier seasons? I don't know if you've seen them where... There were like Christian prayer circles and stuff like that. and uh... Yeah, I do. There was prayer on our season for sure. Our whole team circled up before challenges and would pray together. They didn't show any of it. And so I would say just because you don't see it, you know, doesn't mean it didn't happen. Ah, okay. You do see a lot of yoga on the beach in many seasons now. We're starting yeah, to see more and more of that. You know, I think, I think they're trying to... Of course, as any, you know, popular TV show does, they're trying to hit hot topic buttons. Christianity, you know, I don't think it's as cool, so we don't need to show it. <laughs> um, you know, I eat a lot of rice and uh, I'm really good <laughs> at making rice. And when I watch you guys make rice, I feel like it's a little bit too claggy and uh, sticky and it's not falling <laughs> apart the way my rice is. Why can't they cook rice on the island? What's wrong? I don't know. I felt like if we got to eat rice that day, it was great. Oh, some days you don't get rice? Well, it depends like when the challenges are and when you get back from everything. Because if you go to a challenge and tribal council, you might not have time to make the rice. Oh. Um, and 
and yeah, everybody's so starving that like, if you get to eat anything, like it tastes amazing. I looked forward to low tide because I'd go eat the snails off the rocks in the ocean. And now that sounds disgusting, <laughs> but like at the time I looked forward to it. Wow. Amazing. So, um, at the end of my episodes, I ask my guests to leave a closing thought, just something nice, a positive, uplifting message of hope for the listener. So you don't know who's listening, but just keep it general, a positive message. What do you think you might be able to say to anyone that's out there listening now? I would maybe encourage people to look at many of the components of the faith. And maybe you're not at the point that you're willing to believe or to say that Jesus Christ is Lord or not willing to say that, you know, you know that God, the Father created you but maybe you're willing to try to give sacrificially out of your income to those less fortunate than you. Maybe you're willing to forgive people that you're bitter against or to work toward forgiveness, if that's you know too big of a step initially. Maybe there's a step that you could take, that you could try on God's ways and just see how that goes. You know, Is it really better to give than to receive? Is it possible to forgive someone who's hurt you and wronged you? And is that better than not forgiving them? Uh, things like that. I, I guess that would be something I would, I would encourage you to do, because I do believe that God has a purpose and a, and a will for our lives. And the more we can align our lives with his purposes, really the, the better we're going to thrive and the, and the better our relationships are going to thrive, the better our, our work is going to go, the better our lives are going to go. So that would be my encouragement. If you like your worldview, if you think it's swell, if you've got some questions, ask me and I'll tell. All you've got to do is ask. All you've got to do is ask.